Good morning. It is 9.05, Wednesday, June 10th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and there's something different about me this week, but I can't put my finger on it. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And Joe, great haircut, pal. Thanks. Jonathan Green, DJ Stable General Manager. What, do you got a job interview, Joe? <laughs> Every time... I'm- Every time I talk to you, it's like a job interview. Joe. Exactly. As well, it should be. I mean, you're looking well coiffed. You got a collared shirt on. I, I don't know. I, I'm like, who is this guy? He must be must be Jones and for a new position or something. I finally went outside. <laughs> Brian Dietonato, racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. I got a haircut too, but my fiance did it. So it's not quite as good as Joe's. Not quite as nice. Oh, my girl did it too. Oh, yeah. Well, she did a better job than yeah. <laughs> I was telling everyone you can you'll see how good of a job she did by whether I'm wearing a hat on the podcast. So <laughs> I'm rolling, rolling with it for at least a week. You had you had better clay to mold than I did. I think that's a big part of it. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland will conduct an online select horses of racing age sale on June 23rd in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Entries are accepted through this Friday, June 12th at noon. Learn more at www.keenelanddigital.com. Big weekend for racing. We're going to get into it. Big weekend for Keeneland grads. Kamiko in the 2000 Guineas. Kittens Joy Colt was the $90,000 September yearling purchase. Improbable got his grade one win in the Hollywood Gold Cup. Macoma, another September graduate. McKinsey, uh, Swiss Skydiver, cheap September sale purchase. And in still regard and code of honor. So uh, pretty much a clean sweep of the major races in the U.S. for Keeneland September grads across the board. And uh Looking forward to that big sale in the fall. They're going to get a little bit of a test run with the horses of racing age sale in terms of digital bidding. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But figure what well, people people have a chance to get familiar with it. John did. And I think it'll probably end up going off without a hitch by the time we get to September. So another big weekend for Keeneland grads and Keeneland June horses of racing age sale coming right up. So we have breaking news here on the TDN Writers Room. Uh, this just broke on Twitter a little while ago and then was confirmed later on that Maxfield is going to miss the Kentucky Derby. He has a condylar fracture. He's in surgery reportedly right now. Um, obviously, that changes things a ton. Uh, it's unfortunate, really, for Brendan Walsh. We had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. So he's done a great job with that horse. So, And this was his first grade one winner. This isn't a guy that has a revolving door of grade one rent winners and top three-year-olds. So feel for him initially. Obviously, the people at Godolphin who have been all in trying to win the Derby sucks for them, but they'll they'll probably have another couple of shots down the line. I, and more than anything, I'm just – I'm sad that he wasn't able to stay together because I was a fan of his, if you remember, going back to the early days of the podcast. Um, I, I picked him out after his maiden win. Then he won the British Futurity. had to scratch from the uh, British Cup Juvenile. That was really unfortunate. I thought he could have been champion two-year-old, but he could have been champion three-year-old this year. And it just, it it wasn't meant to be for whatever reason. Um, It stinks. You can't fault anybody. These things just happen. And uh, we're sorry for the connections. And we're sorry that we won't get to see him most likely the rest of the year. Yeah, not much else to add to that, Joe. But, you know, we always talk about the attrition. And, you know, this is very common to see this, but this seems to be well above what is normal now. I mean, we've lost Maxfield, Nadal, and Charlton within, what, about two weeks' time. And, you know, any one of those three could have been a superstar. Uh, you know, some will come back and race, some won't. Uh, I don't know exactly what the plans are for Maxfield going forward. I, I'm sure they would like to get him back to the race. We'll find that out more. But, boy, it's been a brutal year so far. Yeah, just like we were talking about the uh, the two-year-olds and how a lot of them aren't betting out at the, at the OBS sale, this is just such an unusual year of starting and stopping and, getting horses peaked and then trying to throttle them down and then trying to get them ready again to be at top, um, you know, racing conditions going, you know, eight, nine, 10 furlongs. It's just a really, really difficult uh, process on top of the fact that they're, you know, again, they're very fragile. I mean, they're just fragile animals, which is why you have to, you know, enjoy them while they're running well and staying sound and, and on top of the game. Um, you know, I'm not on a personal note, you know, it sucks because it was my number one pick, but as a fan of the industry, it really stinks because, he was the kind of horse that had the racing style um, and and the uh, the class and the ability to be able to handle these kind of longer races and and was really setting up perfectly for the way that the uh, the big races the Triple Crown were all coming together. 
Um, you know, maybe he didn't deserve to even have this chance in a normal year because if the Derby was in May and the Preakness in May, um, he definitely wouldn't have been able to run in those. So maybe the racing gods are telling us that it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't his year, but it just really, this is a kick in the gut for, for, for three-year-olds, uh, you know, three-year-old group in, in general, and you know, for racing fans. Um, it stinks because I really, really would have loved to watch him run. And, and uh, I was very excited to, to see him peaking um, as we were entering these uh, final derby preps in uh, the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I mean, you guys nailed it hit the nail on the head. Uh, what can you say? You got to feel for especially Brendan Walsh and all the connections and, you know, hopefully he can come back from this and maybe have a good four-year-old year, but it's just a shame. So what a weekend of racing we had. Uh, this, this was really the, the return of top flight racing across the country. And it seems like we're basically in full swing now. Belmont coming up next Saturday. And then we'll have Saratoga in a couple weeks after that. Team hunts, uh, summer meet as well. Um, so we're going to get to go through a lot of the performances over the weekend. There's a lot to talk about. Um, I wanted to first talk about the two sprint performances that I thought were super, super special. And that's Bacoma, which we, who we mentioned in the Keelan ad and in the Carter and Volatile um, in the Aristides at, at Churchill. Both of them got the same buyer, 112, which I don't know if there's any sprinters in the country besides Matoli and Imperial Hand that got those kind of numbers last year. Uh, Vacoma is such an interesting horse, if nothing else, because of the way he moves. He was an early two-year-old, didn't quite go on to the Derby and Classic distances. Now is back, focused solely on being a one-turn sprinter, and was incredible, I thought, in the Carter. Really just blew them away. Um, another side, interesting sidebar to that that I might bring up is the, la the lack of performances from Jason's service horses. Forense Fire, who loves Belmont, was a non-threatening fourth in the Carter. Monongahela, who's an okay horse really nowhere to be found in the Westchester. But besides Vacoma, I thought Volatile, who is a big gray beast for Steve Asmussen at Churchill Downs, really ran a 112 buyer and really did not get extended at all. I thought he was absolutely incredible. He was wrapped up, ran 107.57, I believe, for six furlongs. So that's just an incredible effort. Second dam is Lady Tack, who we mentioned before. Steve Chirac of the TDN did a good story about how casual, who we've mentioned before in the show, and Volatile are, are both descendants of Lady Tech. Super impressive. And I think if these horses stay healthy, we might have two Matolis this year in the sprint division. Uh, what do you guys think? You can talk about that. You can talk about any other performances you liked. Bill, I'll start with you. Yeah, I'll just uh, stay on the Vacoma bandwagon. I totally agree, Joe. I mean, this horse is very impressive. And you look back at his body of work as a three year old last year, he did win the Bluegrass. And so, you know, the Bluegrass did not come up all that strong. Then he petered out in the Kentucky Derby. And we haven't seen him since then. I'm wondering though, you know, why would they want to restrict him just sprinting when he's already won in a mile and eighth around two turns as a three-year-old? Uh, George Weaver's a very good trainer. He knows what he's doing, but I'd actually like to see this horse go on, maybe try the Met Mile and then maybe go for the Whitney or something like that. But, you know, if they figured out that he's just a rocket ship at seven furlongs, then so be it. Uh, very good performance. I don't want to steal John Green's thunder because I know he wants to talk about this, but newspaper of record is a big story too. Uh, I mean, she looked as a, a two-year-old like an absolute superstar and did absolutely nothing as a three-year-old, came back for Chad Brown and got back into the winner's circle there. So uh, those are my couple of comments for that and let John take it away. Yeah, Bill, you know, it's funny. I, I just started watching Succession. Uh, we're binge watching it. And at one point, one of the sons says, you know, it goes without saying that I would be the best CEO, but that goes without saying. And one of the other brothers says, you can't say that if you've already, if you've said it out loud. And so, Bill, thank you for not stepping on my toes on newspaper of record, but you stepped on my toes on newspaper of record. Um, it's definitely the, the race that I that I was going to highlight, um, you know, for, for this uh, podcast. I mean, she came back, hadn't run in almost 11 months, um, came back in a grade three on a yielding turf course, which is, um, you know, which, which you can say plays into her strength, but I'm sure, you know, she's run even better numbers on a, on a nice, tight, um, firm turf course. And she came back in one in hand in a 103 buyer. Um, and I think it looks like that, that Chad um, and, the, and the owners have decided sprinting her, at least in the, in the beginning stages, is probably the right thing to do. Um, and there's all kinds of great sprint stake races at Saratoga and Belmont, uh, you know, this summer and fall on the docket. So if they keep her to sprinting or at least to one turn um, races, you know, she should be dominant there. Well, again, a 103 buyer. And talking about dominance, how about the fact that Chad Brown finished first, second, third, and fourth 
in this race. I mean, a clean sweep for all the points and, and for like 95% of the money um, in the uh, Intercontinental, which is a great three. So it's not even like it was a listed stake and you threw a bunch of horses in there. Um, but you talk about super trainers and I know, uh, you know, Bill loves Chad on the turf, especially and rightfully so. But first four finishers for four different owners, um, that's really impressive, uh, you know, headline by newspaper of record. The only other race that, that you guys mentioned um, that I just want to uh, dovetail on is volatile. I mean, you know, to run um, not only 112 buyer, but to basically tie the track record out at Churchill um, and do it in a hand ride where nobody was even within the zip code of him um, coming down the stretch. Wow, that was super impressive. And I don't know about you guys. I don't know if it's just the lack of races that, that, that we've had, you know, to this point, but are things gearing up in a big way? I mean, it really looks like that come the Triple Crown for the three-year-olds and come the Breeders' Cup later on in the year, there's just going to be a host of great prep races. Um, and, and it's a good time to be a fan and a good time to be covering this industry. Yeah, I mean, there's when you look at this, the calendar going forward, there's just so many big races every weekend coming up. And, you know, the schedule kind of got condensed, but it's definitely going to be an exciting time. Um, kind of, you guys kind of said a lot of the stuff I would probably say too. I think Vacoma is at least under consideration for the Met Mile. Um, and I'm pretty sure, I think Code of Honor is also looking at that and McKinsey. So three three big performances from Saturday. It looks like those horses could all end up there if things break right. And I mean, I think the really impressive thing about newspaper record is when you see a really precocious two-year-old like that, it's very rare that they ever, you know, put it back together later in their career. I guess it's just the, you know, impressive horsemanship of Chad. Um, I think under a lot of trainers, that probably doesn't happen. And I've kind of, from a betting perspective, I've kind of gotten to starting to just lean on Chad in certain spots when his horse really looks that good. They just always show up kind of unlike maybe any other trainer His, you know, when his horses should win, they do win. Um, so I thought that was impressive. I'm going to be the uh, turn in the punch ball with newspaper of record. Uh, just very impressive performance. Um, first of all, the thing that Bill hates happened, she was nine to five when she left the gate was six to five in the opening furlong. So I'm not gonna hold that against her, but just thought I'd mention that. Um, she ran well, it was good to see her back. 103 buyer, obviously impressive, but you know, John, you said that she would probably be just as good on a firm turf course. Well, I've got her PPs right here. Debut Saratoga yielding course, Belmont Miss Grillo yielding course, Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf yielding course, all three blowout wins. Then she came back on a good turf course in the Edgewood and lost at one to five. She was 15 cents on the dollar in the wonder again on a firm turf course, lost and was second. Uh, and then in the Belmont Oaks, eight to five favorite was ninth on a firm turf. So I think at this point, at least, you have to say that she's better than on a yielding turf than she is on firm ground. And I thought that that kind of was visually evident to me, at least in the final furlong of that race, where it just didn't seem like anybody else closed and anybody else handled the ground. And if you look, the last furlong of that race was 13 seconds flat, which is unheard of, basically, on a turf course. Obviously, the yielding turf affected that a little bit, but I thought it was just a little illusory that nobody else really closed, nobody else really ran. Like you said, Chad, Chad ran one, two, three. You know, I, not to take anything away from her performance, I thought it was very good, but I got to see it again. And especially with the way she, she faded out as a three-year-old, I got to see that happen again. Maybe she'll come back um, in the Diana or the Justa game or something like that. But I hats off to her for coming back. Like you guys said, great training job by Chad to get her back to her peak. But I got to see it on a firm turf course against a better field. That's fair. That's that, that's a that's a fair sentiment. I will hold off on putting out a, a full page ad on her then. <laughs> um, also, a couple other other performances I wanted to mention. Swiss Skydiver got another win in the Santa Anita Oaks. Um, I love that, you know, even on a bad weekend for Bob Baffert, because, you know, we first of all, we haven't even talked about authentic and honor AP, where you're going to talk to John Sheriffs later. But even on a bad weekend for him, when he lost Charlton for a while and was second um, in the San Diego Derby with the favorite, he got improbable, a great one win. And then McKinsey won the triple bet the following day. So it's even a bad weekend is not all that bad in the world of Bob Baffert. Well, let's talk about the San Anita Derby. Um, now that we have our, our, rollicking fantasy duel going on um honor ap i would agree with what john said last week about how it was kind of put up or shut up time for him and he really did show up and 
know, he got a little bit of a break with authentic, authentic breaking a little bit awkwardly and outwardly. He got pumped wide a little bit, but I just, you kind of, at least I got the impression that that gap between the two of them from Saturday is not going to get smaller going 10 furlongs. And that's what I, I think my main takeaway was. And honor AP, by the way, gorgeous animal, like completely like black beauty type animals. Incredible. Like you actually reminds me a little bit of Zenyana in that way. And we'll ask John about it, but you know, I think going forward, he's the one you want going classic distances. Um, authentic, I think still has a lot of talent, but you know, just with a hot pace in the Derby, I think he's, I, I wouldn't want him as much. What'd you guys think of the big three-year-old race of the week? Then? You know, it, it's funny. I didn't quite get all the hype for honor AP going into this race. Uh, Tom Quigley, who's one of the simulcast hosts uh, from San Anita, told me it's a one horse race. Honor AP absolutely will win. This is a guy with a great opinion. And you, you looked at it, and I know it's not always A plus B equals C in horse racing, but in the previous start, Authentic beat Honor AP and, and beat uh, him pretty handily. But, you know, people obviously saw something in this horse, saw a horse that was going to get better as time goes on. And he really did make that big quantum jump that you see from three-year-olds. That's one of the interesting things about three-year-olds is, you know, they can be so good in March and then be 10 lengths better in May and maybe another five lengths better in June or something like that. So he certainly seems like he's made that progression and is going on. And then, you know, poor Bob Baffert, and I say that facetiously, but, you know, I and others were writing a month and a half ago that the guy, you know, Derby was over. It's just a matter of which Baffert horse would win. And, and within about 10 days, he lost two of them, Charlatan and uh, Nadal, and then has authentic, you know, not run terribly, but go from, you know, one of the top, top horses for the Kentucky Derby down to maybe six or seven. So once it looked like Bob Baffert, was going to definitely win the Kentucky Derby. Now it looks like he has almost no chance. But then again, and we didn't mention that $3.65 million purchase, Cezanne did break his maiden on the Saturday card at church, excuse me, at San Anita in his first start. So, you know, maybe the bandwagon will get rolling for him now. Yeah, and I understand that that Bafford was down at the OBS sale, which I know we'll, we'll dovetail to later, um, and was already, you know, scouting out the recruits for, uh, you know, two-year-old sale and and see if he can regroup and and retrench. Um, let's stick with with the uh, the run happy Santa Anita Derby, the Grade One. Um, you know, Honor AP, very impressive. I don't need to to to, uh, to beat that anymore. They did get a little lucky with Authentic breaking as poorly as he did. Um, Authentic, you know, broke outwardly and then and then took a little time to kind of regroup and, and get back up to the, up to the front. Um, and that may have cost them. Would it have cost them the win? I don't really think so. Um, but would it have been closer? Maybe but that's horse racing. I mean, you have, you have to go with the way that the race plays out. Um, and authentic was, you know, had favorable breaks for the other races that he ran in. And, and this one, he didn't. Um, that being said, you know, tip of the cap to, to Brian again, with all, all kidding aside, for trading with me and then being able to pick up on her AP, um, you know, at the end of the first round in, in our handicapping contest, because it looks like right now that, that he and, and tis the law, um, you know, are, are maybe the favorites going into the gate. Yeah, I got lucky. I was, I was hoping that, you know, Al had the fourth pick and I had the fifth and I was hoping that he would uh, take authentic so I could take on her AP just because I thought at a mile and eighth um, and further, he's a way more, way better prospect. Um, he did get a setup. He, you know, I, I think obviously authentic probably didn't run his race um, for contest purposes. I, you know, I guess he's going to run in that Del Mar race going a mile on the 16th. That seems like the most likely option. So I guess I won't get as many points as I hope to there, but uh, he should be fresh and ready for the Derby. And I think, I mean, if he and Tizzle all throw it down, turning for home, that's going to be a great race. Uh, and, I mean, we might as well talk a little bit more about the contest since I'm feeling pretty good right now where I stand. Oh, yeah, you're in first place. Let's talk about the contest. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I think I and I think all my other three are going in the Belmont. I think pneumatics going now too. So I know, you know, Joe's got the big favorite, but I think I've got the three that can that can take him down or at least run second, third, and fourth. So I'm feeling pretty good right now. And don't forget that Bill that Bill and I have our, you know, one of our top candidates, um, the BN Cohn um, you know, horses running in a no-point allowance race today. <laughs> and also, oh, I'm, I'm toast. I mean, forget it. Charlton yeah. is my number one pick, and that lasted about a day and a half. So, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm working on two, three, and four. I, I mean, that's, you know, what are you going to do? But I'm, I'm, I'm out. It's, it's over. Never know. Yeah, I wasn't crazy about my last couple of picks, but I'll, I'll hang my hat on taking Fizzle all over Charlotte. 
That's right. That's right. And Bill, you, you announced the concept was, was over like after Joe picked his the law. You're like, that's it. It's over. Everything's done. <laughs> well, because he's a really good horse and he's going to run in everything. Nobody else wants to run in any of these races except for this horse. I mean, you know, he's pointing for all three Triple Crown races and the Travers. So, you know, he just shows up. Forget it. It's all over. Yeah. How about the fact that I know it has nothing to do with the contest, but how about the fact that, you know, you got John Sheriffs and you got Barkley Tag with two of the favorites, you know, now for the Kentucky Derby two old time, old school trainers um, that, that really have no question about their integrity or, or, or their histories. Um, I think it's wonderful for the game that, that those two are, are, you know, leading the campaign and, and have the two top horses right now. So we can, we can, we can use that, uh, that chat about how me and Brian basically have the, the Belmont cornered into a chat about how, the Belmont has deteriorated in quality in just a week or two because I mean we were talking a few weeks ago when they first announced the date of the Belmont how well this might be the best of the three three year old rate of the Triple Crown races because you know everybody's raring to go out of the gate they need a big race to run their horses in and now Charlatan's out Nadal's out it's a it's a little unfortunate that we thought we would get this such a great field for the Belmont much better than we would in a normal uh, Triple Crown non Triple Crown year but. You know, it's still going to be a big race. It's still going to be great to see uh, the the Belmont Stakes run in New York after all that's happened. Um, but yeah, it's a little a little unfortunate that we're not going to get the same show that we once got. And it's just it's it's like what we've talked about about how we went from this dearth of racing to like a cornucopia of racing where there's everything every three year old race you could possibly want is going to be on the calendar in the next couple of months. And I think that's going to hurt the preakness a little bit and where it is on the calendar. Because after this summer, after, you know, when you run two or three times and then try to run in the Derby and run in the Derby, you're going to want to run in four weeks or you're going to want to wait to keep your horse fresh for the Breeders' Cup. I think, like, that's the Preakness is probably going to end up with a pretty crappy field, too. And, you know, the Derby, by going first and by staking their place on the calendar without notifying anybody else, Churchill kind of really uh, cornered it there for the Derby. Obviously, the Derby is always going to be the, the crown jewel, but uh, they kind of they, they kind of put – Preakness and Belmont in a bad spot, and uh, the Belmont is suffering a little bit right now. Yeah, I mean, at one point we are looking at the Belmont perhaps being Tizalaw, Nadal, um, Charlatan, and um, Maxfield, and now you only have Tizalaw among all those horses that's going for it. You know, a couple points. First of all, you're getting what the last thing you want to see, especially in the first leg of Triple Crown, again, that's four to five favorite in, in Tizalaw, maybe even three to five. I mean, he looks so strong in there. And then the horses that are lining up behind him are all nice horses, but nothing all that special. And it also shows you the strength of the Kentucky Derby, even in this weird year where the Kentucky Derby is going second. You know, people are not treating the Belmont Stakes really as the first leg of the Triple Crown. You know, there's no finger pointing here. Naira did the best they could. They got unlucky and they're going to get a race that unfortunately isn't uh, going to be anything what we were thought about two weeks ago. Yeah, we've been we've been kind of highlighting the Belmont as a quote unquote Kentucky Derby prep. And I know Naira doesn't like when we, when we say that, but in reality, that's what it's turning into. I, I don't know. I think it's still going to be a good race. I mean, sure. It's not going to be, you know, all the heavyweights in one spot. It's still going to be an interesting race. Um, I mean, there are a lot of years when the Belmont's really not that interesting and it's, you know, the non triple crown years, it's really kind of afterthought horses. It, it kind of, in some ways it means more this year um, than it would in other years. So, you know, I think it, it's still an interesting race and we're gonna have a lot of interesting races and this triple crown is always going to be weird and you know it's not the end of the world to me in the staff book and in the you know in the pedigree page you're always going to be known as a belmont stakes winner and it's a mile and an eighth it's a one turn mile and an eighth to win a classic so i'm just i'm a little surprised that there don't seem to be more people who are you know, going to the Belmont instead of the Bluegrass or some of these lesser races. I don't know. I just, it seems like such, it seems right for the picking, unless you're that afraid of Tis the Law, and obviously I respect him, but uh, he's not like, he's not going to be one to nine in there. Like there's going to, they're going to be some competitors. So I just think it's a little surprising to me that people aren't going for what I think is a cheap classic win because of the distance and because it's not the third leg of the Triple Crown. So, you know, it's a little disappointing, but we're obviously still looking forward to it. And like Brian said, we're still going to, it's still going to be a good race that we'll have lots, lots to say about, especially with the contest after Tesla Law wins. So. I think they're all. I think they're all ducking Doctor Post. I think they've. Uh, oh, you got to. I think that's who they're really yeah. afraid of. We'll see. I don't know. He he beat another. He outworked another Pletcher three-year-old uh, this past week. So I don't know. 
Let's see if he can if his life. You ever like an alert for his work? No, I, they just pop that? up on Twitter right. and I click on. All right, you know, I've just been keeping an eye. All right, it'll be interesting. Right. It's gonna be an interesting race. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Owning a multiple grade stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So West Point wasted no time at uh, OBS Spring yesterday uh, buying the first horse through the ring. The first two-year-old sale we've seen since March. Hope Springs Eternal with two-year-olds. Uh, they also have their first two-year-old runner this Friday at Belmont with a Malibu Moon Colt named Girl Dad, owned in partnership with Rick Patino, the great Hall of Fame basketball coach. Uh, so we wish the best to West Point Thoroughbreds this Friday with all the two-year-olds going forward. And yeah, boys, we're ready to fly now for sure. So Bill had a good story on in his uh, in, in a week in review last week. Uh, T.D. Thornton reported on this yesterday about how Arlington Park it seems is at an impasse in terms of scheduling a 2020 race meet. Uh, they've been kind of going back and forth Arlington and the Horsemen for months, six months now it seems. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last year about how Churchill did not commit to running at Arlington beyond 2021. That kind of had the writing on the wall for Arlington Park probably closing in the near future. But we thought at least we would get to see one or two last meets at Arlington. Uh, Bill, what's your sense of what's going on right now? Well, we still may see something, but things don't look good there. And it's, it's a really messed up situation. So first of all, uh, Arlington was not willing to run without fans in the stands. And that put the whole meet in jeopardy because, you know, when is that going to be able to happen? Looks like they moved beyond that, but then they're at the same sticking point. They can't agree with a contract with a horseman. And I mean, Arlington's purses are I mean, there's no other way to put it. And, you know, that's what happens in the modern age when you're trying to run a racetrack without slots revenue if you're not one of the big players like San Anita or Belmont, something like that. And, of course, again, the background that Churchill Downs turned down the opportunity to have a casino at Arlington. I think the real problem here is that Churchill Downs, as owner of Arlington, has no incentive to open the place up. There's no money to be made. They're looking to get rid of the racetrack anyways. They're only committing to 2021. So, you know, the, and the horsemen at the same time, you know, want some sort of decent purses they can run for rather than running at like literally like Finger Lakes levels. So the horsemen are wanting a two year deal right now, and Arlington is only willing to give a one year deal. Will this come together at the last minute? You know, it possibly it could. Matter of fact, you know, these things usually have a way of working themselves out. But whatever, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good going forward. And also, as part of this, whether they run or not, there's not going to be any Arlington Million, Beverly D and Secretariat this year, which they really they can't afford it. I mean, they don't have the money and the horsemen, the local horsemen want that money for purses for overnight races. Uh, those three races probably add up to about two million dollars right then and there. So if you put that two million into overnights, you've got a lot better product. But it's really sad. It's a beautiful racetrack. And Chicago is left with only Hawthorne if it closes. Hawthorne has to run harness racing for much of the year. So you're looking at not having any sort of year-round circuit in Chicago. Uh, you know, I don't know what the answer to this is, but it's not good, whatever it is. It's a, I mean, that's one of my favorite cards. The Arlington Million card is great. Um, and we shipped some horses last summer up to Arlington to run. Uh, the nice thing was that if you're stable at Churchill, well, there's a free shuttle to get back and forth to Arlington. So it was kind of a good spot for – for guys stuck in Kentucky in the summer um, as another option. So, I, you know, I hope they, they figure something out, but it doesn't sound great. I mean, I think it would be ironic and, and unfortunate that, you know, there's, there's so many tracks around the country that just nobody cares about, nobody goes to. I mean, obviously the horsemen that are there care, but, like, on a, in general, the public doesn't care. Arlington is a place where people show up. They show up every weekend in thousands and tens of thousands to go to that beautiful track. And it's just, it would be really unfortunate that, you know, there's so many other tracks that I think 
most of us think could close before Arlington. Arlington would be probably one of the last tracks we would think of as, as needing to close. And, you know, like Bill said, it's just, this is honestly about Churchill and about their unwillingness to apply for a gaming license because they have a nearby casino that they don't want to compete with. You know, from a bottom line perspective, I understand that, but Arlington's a historic racetrack and it's, it really is important to the, to the Chicago community and to the, to the Illinois racing community because it's not like one of these tracks in the Mid-Atlantic where there's 7,000 other places you can run within a bus ride or a van ride. Like, that's not the case in Arlington. Yeah, like Churchill is fairly nearby, but other than that, like there's no other major racing in the area. So the Illinois horsemen are really, you know, dependent on this Arlington summer meet. And that's just, you know, if Arlington goes, I think most of the horses are going to go from Illinois. And that's just, it's been a vibrant racing market before. And it's, it, it would not be the first one I would choose to lose in this sport. And it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, the company that owns the place really has no interest in keeping it open. And, you know, the, the fans be damned, the horsemen be damned. They don't want that to compete with their casino. Sucks, man. Wish we had some more racing forward ownership entities in this business. And, you know, that's just not one of them. You know, as, as great of a job as they do with Churchill, it's just everything else is an afterthought. So that, that sucks. And we hope that they can at least work something out for this year and next because this is not the way we want Arlington Park to go out if it is going to go out. So we don't have super, super uh, accurate conclusions to draw just yet from the OBS spring sale. First day of bidding was yesterday. Second day of bidding is going to kick off in a few minutes uh, here on the East Coast. And I would defer here mostly to John and Brian, mostly because Bill's going to fall asleep when we talk about this. But uh, are there any early impressions from the first day? I, I saw that there was a ghost sapper filly that sold for, as the topper for $750,000. Next to second highest lot was like four hundred thousand, so that doesn't seem great. But uh, I'll toss it over to John and then Brian. Yeah, in, in general, um, first and foremost, you know, kudos to OBS and Tom Ventura and the uh, shareholders at OBS for you know playing forward and and continuing to to you know stick with the mantra of we're going to get the sale off, we're going to get the sale off, and they were the last two year old sale that was offered, and now they're the first ones, at, you know, kind of post Corona for lack of a better term, um, that that's offering, um, actually not only, you know, online bidding, but live bidding as well. And they seem to have been able to get that synchronicity together. So obviously it's great that they offered both platforms of, uh, being able to bid online as well as, uh, you know, on in person, um, as far as overall takeaways from the first day, the, the good horses and sound like a broken record, the good horses are getting found and they're getting purchased. Um, the bad horses aren't getting any bids whatsoever. And the in-between horses are actually down probably about a third to 50% in value. Um, and Brian, you can, you can kind of give me your, your feeling on that as well in a, in a minute or two. Um, but one of the things that I'm finding just from being a participant and also having, you know, clients that are consigners and pinhookers is that one of the major complaints, um, in, in this sale has to do with a lot of horses that aren't betting out. And, you know, the consigners, some of the consigners are pointing to the fact that they're saying, you know, the track's inconsistent and, um, you know, the, 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 it was a lot of rain and it wasn't favorable for their horses. That may be true. Um, but in reality, what the consigners, I think, are missing out on in the thought process is that these are horses, for the most part, that should have been sold in the Miami sale in March or in certainly in the April sale that was should have been, you know, six, seven weeks ago. So what they've had to do from a training standpoint is gear up these babies to, you know, as if they were going to be selling in, in March or April and then pulling them back a little bit and not knowing what's going to happen for, you know, for about six weeks or so, and then trying to ratchet them back up and gearing them up to, to be able to breed, you know, but even if they breeze an eighth of a mile, it means they have to be at least two and a half to three furlongs fit because they have to be able to gallop out strongly um, in order to get the big money. And I think because of these horses are so young and these, you know, uh, conditioners, pinnockers, consigners aren't used to this process um, of having, you know, to sell good horses in June when they geared them up for a sale in March or April, it never happened. And now they have to, to re-ratchet them up. I think that's causing a lot of stress and a lot of issues, um, you know, with these young horses. And that's where you're coming up with shins and you're coming up with, you know, P1 chips and P2 chips and, 
and other issues that end users aren't going to want to buy. And I think that's why a lot of these sources that would bring a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars are bringing thirty or forty because they are not betting out, or they and or they didn't they didn't breeze well um, because they just weren't able to get you know reconfigured back up to being peaking here in June. Um, Brian, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the vetting is a big part of it. Um, it seems like there are a lot of outs. Uh, I think the horses that do pass the vet and are appealing are there's still good money for those. It's not easy to get them, and maybe it's because demand is a little smaller and there's or uh, supply is a little smaller and demand is still pretty high. Um, I don't think consigners are giving away the horses that they think are are good. I don't, you know, and, and I think the other weird dynamic is at the end of every day you have horses that were in the Gulfstream sale, and that's typically you know the highest average of any two year old sale. The big fancy dirt horses and you know the four hundred thousand dollar pin hooks and that kind of thing and i think with those you saw really that it was feast or famine um the topper the ghost zapper colt came out of there and a couple others sold well sold well but you had a ton of outs um the breezes were very hit or miss like on our ratings we they were either you know a's or c's they didn't really there wasn't a lot of in between uh, and i think you're kind of seeing that that extra training um some horses are doing better and some horses are Doing work, you know, they're going one way or the other. There's not, you're kind of getting a better feel for how good a horse is, maybe, or how at least they can handle training. Um, but I think it's kind of polarized in that way, more in a kind of a different way than it normally is. And then it's also hard to buy two year olds right now when there are two year old races going on. I mean, it, it, it's it's a little strange because you're buying a horse that maybe is an eighth of a mile fit or, or a quarter mile fit, and you know that you have you know, two, three, four months, maybe six months ahead of you of bills before you start getting them to get ready to run. In the meantime, you know, you have a lot of, I think maybe weekly now you're going to see these baby races that are running at all the racetracks. Um, so it, it's a little tough to try to, you know, unless you're going to buy a two-turn horse, it's a little tough to, to try to dip in and, and, and get involved and get excited about it. Um, unless it's one of those bell ringers, Brian, like you mentioned. Great, John. You just talked me out of uh, our first horse to bid on today. I'm going to have to make a phone call. <laughs> cancel that. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. This was in the news last week, um, and it continues to be a story about TBG not getting the signal for both Naira and Churchill Downs at the beginning of these, these, these monster race meets. Um, I think it's a big deal because a lot of people do rely on TBG to see those, to see that stuff and to bet on that stuff because, you know, not everybody has Naira bets or, you know, on, on Twin Spires. Um, it's basically the only localized hub for viewing races and live racing. Now that's slowly changing. Naira has obviously branched out a ton in terms of Fox Sports One and Fox Sports Two here in here in the New York area. MSG. Um, I think it makes sense for them to try to have that exclusive partnership and direct people to Naira bets rather than having TVG broadcast their signal and then directing people to TVG, which they have nothing to do with. But I think it's I think people see it as a little bit of racing dysfunction, that there isn't just one centralized place to watch horse racing. And TBG was that for a while, but it just seems like it's kind of going to be frozen out over time as these tracks and these jurors and these companies all get their own ADWs. Bill, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. You know, first of all, uh, you have to realize what Naira did here. I mean, they, they weighed their options and, you know, and they, I don't think they said specifically, but it's obvious that Fox Sports said, look, if we're going to give you all this time for racing and, and the, the wall to wall coverage of racing on Fox Sports now is unlike anything we've ever seen before. I mean, 10 times like anything we've ever seen before. So th they obviously didn't want TVG to be showing the same thing. They didn't want competition for their own broadcast. 
you know, I'm kind of don't have a dog in this fight because I think, and I think I'm more like most consumers now. Honestly, I don't watch TVG because I only watch races on the computer. They're streaming from the tracks through, through an ADW. So, you know, but I understand a lot of people are really upset about this, but, you know, there's still, remember, there's still an avenue. It's, you have Fox Sports, you have your computer, you want to watch Nata Racing, if you want to watch Churchill Racing, you can still watch, you can still watch, it's not like you're going to be shut out, but you are right, Joe, I mean, you know, there's all the fiefdoms with their ADWs, and, you know, they're deciding, again, what's good for the individual, not what's good for the sport overall, and, you know, that's the type of subject uh, and type of problem we've been seeing for the last hundred years, and probably we'll see for the next hundred years to come. Yeah, my, my only comment is in a perfect world, I would, it, it, as the end user, it would be great to be able to have one place to go to to watch all these great races or watch, you know, my horses run. That being said, there's not one station that, that I go to to watch, you know, my, my non-horse racing, um, uh, you know, stories and shows. Um, you know, you have Netflix, you have um, HBO, you have multiple different uh, platforms of, of places where you go. Um, you know, you're hoping and we've been we've been championing the fact that because of COVID, a lot of these groups that normally would be at war with each other are getting together and, and kind of sitting around the table and maybe not singing Kumbaya, but at least they're working together to get a better product for everyone in the industry. That's not necessarily the case here, um, but I understand why they're doing it. And, and, you know, Bill, just like you said, it, none of us are married to like the three networks anymore. Like we did when we were kids. There's multiple platforms and multiple opportunities to watch these races. The key is as long as they're being shown, that's the key. As long as we have an outlet to be able to watch the, the horses run, um, and if you want to, to gamble on them, that, that's, uh, that's really the important underlying thing here. I will say, but from a TDN perspective working, it's really a pain. You know, we're all working from home right now. And at the office, we have two big TVs and we have RTN and we can switch between all the different tracks. And it's great. And we have TVG too. Um, but at home, you know, I find I've been mostly watching the Naira show and I think they do an amazing job. I think it's really, you know, better than anything out there and just really good. Um, but I pretty much missed half those Santa Anita races just because I had to choose one, you know, and, and you're trying to, it's just hard to watch everything. I think there are probably a lot of people who are missing one track or the other. Um, I don't know what the answer is. It'd be great if everyone could get along and figure things out, but you know, it's typical racing, I guess. That's right. It's racing, exactly. Yeah, it's racing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it from, from an Irish standpoint, you know, because they have their own AW, because they have their own programming. I get it. They're trying to take over the market, which I completely understand. I'm like, I'm no huge fan of TVG, honestly. Like, I think there are smart people on there for sure. And I think they've done a good job being the kind of the, the locust of, of racing broadcasting for a long time. But just in terms of the product, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's helpful, like, from a handicapping standpoint, I just think it's it's kind of a little past its time, you know what I mean? As as the centralized location for people to watch racing, and they just I don't know they haven't they haven't grown the market. I don't think. With their, I think they've been kind of been doing the same thing for a long time, and uh, I, I really have no problem with Naira stepping and trying to do it their way. But it just I think there are some customers who are going to get you know a little a little squeezed out in the meantime. But I think that'll that'll adjust over time as people get more into the, the ADWs and, and get more familiarized with all the Fox Sports stuff. So I think it'll work itself out over time, but I know there were a lot of people that were frustrated at the beginning of Belmont and Churchill not being able to watch those races on TVG. So I wanted to give it a mention. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting tax consulting advisory firm specializing in a thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more on how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week, again, the man of the hour of the week, the trainer of Honor AP, John Sheriff. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Uh, good morning. Good to have you. So we'll, we'll start with the big horse. Um, he's an interesting horse because I think he was, he was, he was well heralded early in his career. There was a lot of hype about him. I'm going to ask, what at what point did you – realize you had something special on your hands and how did that affect the way you trained him? You know, I think um, we started seeing something in Honor AP when he started to gallop and uh, he started to lengthen his stride. And if you ever see him, he just floats over the ground. It, for a big horse, he doesn't hit the ground at all. 
So it's uh, it was pretty exciting that way. And have you have you been a little bit more careful? Like how how have you spaced his races, knowing that he is so good and has so much potential? Uh, you know, it's a, it's not a it's a matter of when the races come come up. You know, so first you know the first thing he needed to do was to uh, break his maiden. So we ran him short one time and then stretched him out, and he won very nicely. And then uh, it was just a matter of uh, you know finding the the next race. John, hi, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. With the weird year of the Triple Crown with the Kentucky Derby not being run until September, it's kind of um, the conventional thought that this has been a good thing for your horse, Honor AP. It has been a little bit slower to develop than some of the other horses, and now you're in the driver's seat with the Kentucky Derby in September. Do you think it has been an advantage for your horse to have the Derby later than, rather than the normal day? No, I don't think so. I, I think the uh, the exciting thing about the Derby is the unknown factor, and uh, <clears throat> so you have a lot of horses that are precocious, and you have horses that are coming on a little slower. But by May, you, you know they're usually there if they're if they're going to be there as far as ability wise, and uh, so I, I I always thought it was uh, I liked it in May because they're untested in mile and a quarter. By the time September comes around, you'll know everything about the horses and. And it won't be such a mystery. John, it's Jonathan Green from DJ Stable. Thanks for your time today. Um, a quick question for you regarding the fact that, that you purchased the horse for $850,000 as a yearling. Um, and you've been very successful in buying horses as, as yearlings, which is not an easy way to get through the industry, um, as opposed to buying a proven horse or buying a two-year-old where you can, can watch them on the racetrack. Can you give um, you know our, our viewers and listeners an idea of what you look for when you're buying a horse, um, you know, for the big races for the uh, Kentucky Derby or or one of the other you know two turn races that you've been so successful in winning over the years? You know, it's a really a team effort. I have a really good bloodstock agent and David and Gordo, who goes out and looks at the horses. Um, he starts looking at them when they're weanlings, the ones that he, you know, he knows about and is familiar with the pedigrees. So he, he watches those horses as they develop, even before they get to the yearling sale. And uh, his mother, Dottie, who is my wife, is also a, a pedigree expert and, uh, and follows all the racing around the country. So she has a pretty good idea on what sires are, are becoming popular, or which sires are becoming, uh, you know, Pot at that particular time, so I have I have a lot of people that help me in that regard, and then my my thing is I always think of the traditional thoroughbred. I um I like the long and lanky looking thoroughbred. Um, I think that as a you know the shoulder is really important on a horse. It has to have a nice sloping shoulder, a long underline because a long underline will give you a sense of the length of stride. Then obviously there has to be something about the engine, the hind end that, that attracts you. So those are some of the things I look for. The big gaskin, you know, you want to see a forearm with a lot of muscle and a gaskin with a lot of muscle. And if you stand right behind them and, and you look between the hind legs. Maybe you look for a little muscle on the inside of the hind leg because that will give you an idea of the strength of the, uh, of the engine behind them. So, you know, length of hip is one thing, or but then, you know, the broad, how broad the beam is, that's another thing. So everything sort of has to go together. And that one book, Blink, I think is also the uh, big uh, important thing. So the horse has to grab you in some way, you know. If, it, if he doesn't grab you in some way, then probably uh, it's not the horse for you. Um. John, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Zenyatta in this conversation. I'm sure, maybe you're getting tired of answering questions about her, but maybe not. Um, kind of the same question Joe had about Honor AP. When did you know that she was something special? Well, uh, <clears throat> she uh, she came with a big reputation. They, she was broken at the Mayberry Farm. And uh, when, they, when they sent her in, they said, listen, this field is galloping around the track twice for all the other horses once. So... Uh, we knew that she had something, and uh, and uh, I guess specifically when you when you could say that, wow, was one day I worked her with um, Tiago, and uh, Tiago was a stakes winner at, at the time, and uh, and she outworked Tiago, so uh, 
that was that was a pretty good indication that she might be something special. Follow up question on Zenyatta, and there's worse things than being associated with a great mayor like her for the rest of your life. But um, my question is, what do you think it is about her that has stuck with people so long? Because she's still immensely popular, still people are following like her polls and her breeding and all that. What do you think it was about her that stuck out to people so much? I think it was everything about her, her desire to win. I mean, she, she really wanted to win. And then her, her personality was so unique. Um, she, just, she just liked people. You know, when, when, you, <clears throat> when you put the saddle on her and took her to the racetrack, she was one thing. And then when, you, when she was out there with a halter on a lead shank and, and people were taking pictures of her and visiting her, she was another thing. Plus, she was like, um, if you went into a forest and you saw a giant sequoia, that would be Zenyatta, you know, compared to, uh, to, to another uh, evergreen tree. So anyway, I always, I always tell people, you know, if you want to, you get a feeling out of hugging a tree, right? If hugging a tree grounds you and makes you feel better, then you had to come and, and stand next to Zenyatta and lay your hands on her because she just made you feel better. Wow. That's great. Is there anything, I know it's early, but is there anything about Honor AP that reminds you of her? Uh, you know, she's such, in such a special place. I, don't, I can't compare, really, her and him. That, that just wouldn't work. That's fair. John, staying on the theme of Zenyatta, you have a, uh, one of Zenyatta's folds in your barn, a three-year-old filly by the name of Zelda who's not raced yet. What's the latest on her? Yeah, she'll probably run at... Um, at um, Del Mar, and she's she, she broke out of the gate the other day. She probably has to break one more time to get her her gate card to get okayed out of the gate. And she's gone one five eights, and you know she's uh, she's funny. Uh, she's really cute. Uh, the other day we took her to the gate just to stand her, so the assistant thought her put out his arm, reached out to grab her. Right, and she turned her head away. Right, so he he waited a minute, then he reached for her again, and she turned her head away again. Right, so she's uh, <laughs> she's like. Really independent, and uh, but then she she went in the gate and she was fine. So she's just a, a trip. And then so she went to the gate. Then we brought her back to the barn. And that afternoon, I was watching her, and she was laying down, taking a really long nap. So I, I think she said she does that when she does a little bit, and it's kind of like she says, "Okay, John, you know, you made me do a lot today. Take it easy on me tomorrow." All right. So she's just uh, she she's fun to be work around. She looks a lot like her mother too. She, she's uh, obviously she's not nearly as big as her mother, but she has a lot of her mother's uh, confirmation in her. You know, it, it's great, John. You've been in the business so long, and it's just so wonderful that when you mention certain names of horses, when people light up, and you can see that you just lit up when when you start talking about Zenyatta, even after all these years. So. It, it's just a great testament to you as a trainer and, and for the love of the game. Um, you've been a pillar out there in California racing for a number of years. And in the beginning of the year, you know, there were some tough stories going on in, in horse racing that were centered around California between horses breaking down out there and, and PETA and, um, and, and other issues. Um, what do you see out there that's kind of changed that's made racing more positive and have a better feel uh, better energy, you know, now in the middle of 2000 and, uh, 2020? Um, you know, I think um, Santa Anita and, and Del Mar and everything, they tried to address the concerns of, uh, of the people, uh, the fans, and a little bit of the concerns of PETA. And uh, there is a very structured oversight of the, uh, of the training of the horses now. Um, so I think that's probably been... Uh, a real plus so there isn't any question about it uh, we we really miss the fans out here now because we don't we don't know how they're reacting to uh the racing without without them being there so right now um particularly the horses is uh, has always been number one but now they're they're really uh, emphasizing the safety of the horse john we've talked so, about some of your best horses is there a horse that comes to mind that maybe you like a really talented horse that just didn't pan out or you know what I mean something like that or kind of didn't live up to your expectations well you know that's a that's a tough question because um 
they're they're uh, like a chira. I love the chira. That that was a chestnut filly by uh, English Channel, and um, I thought she she had a lot of talent, and she had a lot of talent. But unfortunately, she learned a really bad habit. And um, as you watch races and you see horses that they get their head up a little bit, and the bit gets in the wrong place of their mouth, and then they then the rider can't really control them and try to run through the bit in the first part, and we tried everything in the world to get her to, to accept the bridle and, and put her head down a little bit. And so she would just turn it off and, and then, um, and she would have been so much better. So it never worked out for her. We got really close a few times, but we couldn't do it consistently. I'm going to ask one last question for me. I think we do this sometimes on the show. We put people on the hot seat. Um, I think you're known as a guy who trains horses the right way and is patient. Not everyone's like that. If you had to put on your race, racing commissioner's hat, pretend it's a racing commissioner's hat you're wearing, and do one thing to improve the safety of horse racing, what would you do? Uh, I, would, I would create a uh, committee of, uh, of trainers that, um, that the uh, racing commission and the race management would consult before they made any uh, major changes. And, and try to understand a little bit of uh, what a trainer goes through to um, to get a horse ready for racing. Sometimes I, I don't think they take into consideration all the steps that have to happen. Um, and and so trainers don't get enough input in, the, uh, in some of the rules they make. John, thank you so much for the time. We loved hearing about Zenyatta and those, those, those stories and those metaphors. And uh, we wish you best of luck with Honor AP the rest of the year. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, John Sheriffs will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. To learn more on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, the online select courses of Racing Age Sale is June 23rd in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. You have until this Friday, June 12th at noon to apply. Learn more at KeenelandDigital.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, Brian DiDonato, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, John Sheriffs, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson, Anthony LaRocca, and Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next week.